The Jimmy IV Sexy Cool Lounge is an inspirational podcast spreading positive energy and only good vibes into the universe through personal discovery, empowerment, and self-love awareness. Now, please join me in the Sexy Cool Lounge with our creator and host, Jimmy IV. Good morning, good afternoon, and good night, wherever you might be listening to this episode, and may your vibe be cruising at an altitude that is so sexy cool. So as always, y'all, at the beginning of every episode, if you are new to the Sexy Cool Lounge, thank you. Thank you for giving us some of your time so that we can spread some positivity, some good energy, good vibrations only into your circle, your universe, and on your pathway through life. So thank you so much for stopping through. And if you are so inclined, you're more than welcome to check out any one of our episodes between one and 93, with this being episode number 94. Episodes can be looked at over at the website, www.sexycoollounge.com. And you can always follow the podcast on any one of your favorite podcast platforms. We are on all of them, y'all. And if you are on Instagram, give us a follow at Sexy Cool Lounge. Facebook, you know I'm there. Give me a follow. Send a friend request. I'll send it back. And big news for 2023. Y'all know it. Sexy Cool Lounge is on YouTube, y'all. Go on over there, see my face, <laughs> as well as uh, hear the podcast episodes in audio format. And if you have an Alexa, just say, Alexa, play Jimmy IV Sexy Cool Lounge, and she will make it happen for you, all right? Woo, that was enough. Oh, housekeeping is out of the way. It's time to get down to the nitty gritty of episode number 94. So I'm really excited about this because I've been trying to work on having this gentleman come on my show for a good minute. And we've had a few challenges and he is a very busy person, but I'm sure that what he has to talk about and what he's gonna share with us is gonna be laughter for your soul, all right? So let me just tell you a little bit about my next guest, okay? He is a very special guest because he is an excellent stand-up comedian and his, he has a genius way of interacting with the crowd, y'all. And he's been doing stand-up comedy for over 25 years. And in 25 years, y'all might've seen him on The Tonight Show with Jay Leno, HBO, Showtime, and many TV shows. And he also does appearances in Las Vegas, right? And you can catch some of his upcoming performances in York, PA, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, Bridgeport, Connecticut, and many, many other locations that we will make sure that you have an opportunity to find him wherever he is, because y'all need to go see him, right? So please give a warm welcome and a listening ear into the Sexy Cool Lounge, my friend and Mr. Excellent Comedian Stand Up, Mr. Earl David Reed. How are you today, sir? Good, man. I got to tell you, I'm sitting here listening to this intro, and you got to be one of the smoothest cats out there <laughs> on the internet. And it's going to change right now because you're going to have me on there. I was like, I, you know, you're sitting there. I got a squirt on. This guy's got the sunglasses on and a jacket, you know. And, you know, I'm in here, Pennsylvania, right now where there's no dress code. So, you know. <laughs> well, um, you know, you know that's, that's how we run it in when you come up in the sexy cool glass. But hey, if you ever need somebody to, to uh, give you an intro in one of your shows, bro, hey. Just give me a holler, bro. I was just thinking about that, you know, because, you know, sometimes you go to these places and they get my name wrong, you know, because it's it's Earl David Reed and I and I and I it was Earl Reed. And then SAG came along and said, I can't use Earl Reed because somebody out there was using Earl Reed. And so I had to go Earl David Reed. And uh, and ever since then, it's been fine. But people mess it up. I mean, I've had people have me at a place and put on the sign the wrong name on the sign. You think they'd come up and I've been called, let's say, I've been called, it's Earl David Reed. So I've been called David Earl Reed. I've been called uh, James Earl Jones. I've been called uh, James Earl Ray, which um, uh, made the black people come out in droves for that <laughs> one. Uh, just see if they can get even. But I was, um, uh, you, you know, but I'm just blessed. I love it, man. I'm having a great time. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you so well, much. Well, good deal. But real quick before we get started, just so that everybody else knows around the world what SAG means. Can you tell us what SAG means, please? Yeah, SAG is Screen Actors Guild. And it, it, if you're an actor, you're in it. And I don't know why I'm in it, because I'm not an actor at all. But um, you do when you do a couple of TV shows and stuff <coughs> like that, they make you join that. It's the union. And uh, and but uh, you can't have the same name. You can't have gone with the same name. I've never met the other Earl Reed. I don't even know if he's out there. Um, you know, I've only feel 
better to know that I'm doing better than him because no one's heard of him before. So, you know, not like my name is like, you know, Will Smith or something and I have to change it. Then I would be like, oh, that's great. I'm changing it for that guy. But now it's like I'm changing it for a guy I never met or never heard of. So it's all good. It's all good. So real quick before we get started with anything, right? You know the routine. The same for everybody that comes onto the show. So I'm gonna ask it to you, just like I ask it to everybody else. So, Mr. Earl David Reed, what does sexy cool mean to you? Man, well, first of all, you you actually show it right there. And I think it's actually more than it's just the style though. I think it's the attitude that goes on it. You know, you can put a tuxedo on a pig that don't make them a, a, you know, a debutante, you know? So, I mean, <clears throat> so I think it comes with an attitude and stuff. Sometimes sexy, uh, cool is sometimes it's not saying anything. It's no when not to say nothing. You know, like my mother used to say to me, she says, sometimes the best time of uh, sign of intelligence is when the no when to fake stupidity. And, uh, and it comes across now, especially in this day and age. Now you got to know, to kind of be quiet and shut up because you really can't talk about just about anything, which is a little deadly in this profession. But uh, that's how it's become now. But I think it's I think it's knowing the right thing to say and when to say it. Oh, good, brother. You know, the reason why I asked that question is because there is no right answer or a wrong answer. It's all dependent on the perspective of the person who is giving it. And that, to me, is the most important. I can ask it a million times across the world. And I have. And I've never gotten the same answer twice. So thank you very much for giving us your footprint on that. And let's get started with episode number 94. Brother, so I've been following you for a good minute, and I think you are an, an, um, an excellent artist at what you do. I think it's a craft. I think it's a masterpiece that people can consistently stand up in front of others and make them laugh at things that you see from your perspective in the world, right? And by doing that, it helps to take some attention off of their lives. I think that's a gift. Not everybody can do that. And what I wanted to do today was I wanted to have you on to kind of just shine the importance on laughter. And I felt like you were the best person that could do that because that's what you do. You do it at a very high level and you've been doing it that way for twenty over 25 years. So the first thing I want to do is can you just – help us understand the true connection between laughter, okay, and the human spirit and why that's so important. Well, it's funny you mentioned because it's like um, my whole life, I've always been kind of a show off. I kind of been the kind of guy that was out there. And I always, I always thought to myself that I like to have people around me that were always <clears> happy. So when I first started this, or even before I started it, I always wanted to be the kind of person that could bring a smile to someone's face. It sounds kind of corny, but it's like, you know, I, was, I wasn't I was the biggest kid in the neighborhood, the strongest kid in the neighborhood. And I feel by, you know, um, uh, putting a smile on face, that would keep me out of the, the, the radar of, of being messed with or anything like that. And so that's why I kind of started doing that sort of thing. It was kind of a defense mechanism, if anything else. But um, I, I um, it, ironically, everything I do on stage now was considered in, insubordination when I was in school and I parlayed it into a career. So I, I think it's important to make people be able to laugh because it's like, I mean, look at this day and age. We, we look, we don't even know who we are anymore, you know, and, and without getting all heavy on it. But, you know, when we get to these, when I was a kid growing up. I took a test in school. I was a young kid. I'll never forget this. I brought this home, this test home, and I screwed it up. It was an English test, and it was on pronouns, and I screwed it up, okay? Fast forward to now, my mother needs to take, she needs to recall that beating uh, that I got for screwing up, because we used to get beat back when we messed up in the day. It didn't kill any of us, or none of it was abuse. It wasn't called abuse back then, but I, she was, she's probably looking out, laughing her ass off, going, you know, it didn't really matter. Uh, because uh, it's all mixed up now anyway. So, you know, so I, 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 I'm trying to go with the times and keep out of that trouble there too, so. Sounds good to me, brother. I understand the old school loving and how things used to be and, and it's not that way anymore, you know? Back yeah. then it was tough love. It was, it was, you need to understand attitude adjustment. Now it's, you know, some other things, but we won't even go there, okay? Um, it's funny because yeah. it, it, it's like for a second, um, like perfect example. Grew up in the neighborhood, <clears throat> all the neighborhood, all the parents looked out for all the kids because it takes the village is what they say. You know, your parents could yell at any other kid if they were doing wrong. And that's what kept a lot of us out of trouble because your parents aren't there all the time. 
You know, we didn't have like when I went to high school, I had kids that had the cool parents. You know, they call them by their first name and, you know, oh, hey, Joe, hey, whatever. I'll tell you what, I don't think I knew stay my mother's over, first stay, name. Stay over for dinner. Yeah, exactly. My, I didn't know my mother's first name until I graduated high school. I think that was one of the gifts she gave me. She goes, now this is my first name because I never thought about calling her by it. It's always mom or mother or whatever, you know. But um, it, 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 so it's, it's a whole different other thing now, you know, and I'm just trying to be able to adapt and, and, and being in this business comedically, it's about staying relevant. You know, it's about being able to go, okay. Um, being able to make people laugh. And, uh, and, and I think it's easy to stay relevant if you don't get caught up in the everyday stuff. If you just come out there and try to entertain people, then you become an escapism from what they're seeing outside. All that problem, all that politics, all this uh, 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 gender stuff, all this racism, whatever, that's going to be waiting for you when you get outside. You come in and you see me, we're going to hang out for a while, 90 minutes, we're going to have a great time, and then I'm going to probably try to change your thought process on a little thing about how to enjoy your life, and you take it back out there on the world and defend yourself with it. Simple as that. Well, you, you say when people come to your show, so let's um, let's stay on that topic for a minute. So for someone who wants to come to your show now that they've listened to this episode, give us a little glimpse of what they would expect uh, coming to your show and all of the laughter that goes along with it, brother. Sometimes people have a misinterpretation of what the show is like. In other words, <clears throat> you look at the show and you'll say that and I'll go, oh my goodness, I don't want to be there. I don't want to sit close because he'll pick on you. And what I always do is I like I work off, I'll tell jokes, I work off what's in front of me. So you give me something, I work off of it. I make what you tell me funny. It, you may be saying it, but it, it doesn't necessarily mean it has to do with you. In other words, I'm not going to sit there and go, you know, you're stupid, unless you're stupid. But I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to do that sort of thing. So I, I kind of work off off of uh, of that and because you don't know you don't know what people can take anymore you know you got people running up and hit comedians and stuff and i tell you right now there's a guy uh steve brown is a comedian i think he's out of atlanta uh black before all this went on uh when people getting mad and stuff like that, he was attacked on stage by a guy that uh was sitting in the audience and it's all on videotape these comedy clubs didn't have any security because everyone thinks ha, ha, it's a comedy club. How bad can it be? But they keep forgetting there's alcohol and alcohol changes the landscape of everything. This guy was trying to defend himself for seven minutes on stage before someone came out the kitchen and, and came out and got him. And the, the irony was he really didn't say anything too bad. But the guy that attacked him, <laughs> it turns out that the guy that attacked him, he had just uh, that morning had just gotten out of prison. Okay. And, and and flipped out on his thing. And then I thought to myself, I don't even blame <clears throat> the comedians. I don't even blame the guy that flipped out. I blame his friends. Because let me, Jimmy, if I'm in jail and I get out and you come pick me up, okay, who's thinking they're going, you know what this guy needs? He needs a couple of laughs. We're going to take him to a comedy club. We're not going to take him to a strip club or anything we can get later or anything else like that. We're going to take him to some, some comedy club and have him sit in the front row. So it's just, it's just crazy out there. So when you come out and you see me, it's interactive. It's a lot of fun. It's motivational. Um, it's really where people leave and they'll go, that was really good. They go, do you remember any jokes he says? No. Or they'll try to recreate them and they always mess them up. And uh, uh, But that's what it's about. It's about coming out and being truly entertained. Good deal. So have you always wanted to be a comedian? Let me ask that first. And then if I can follow up with that is that when did you realize that you could take this and like go to a really high level and sustain that and then make a living and a career off of it. I mean, that comes a lot for a lot of people. I mean, it comes and goes for a lot of people. You know, I mean, I started out with some people who, who, um, who, you know, I don't even know where they are. They probably gave it up because they weren't really that good when they were doing it. And then I started out with some of the same people that had taken different avenues. I started out with Kevin James, started out with Dennis Leary, started out with a lot of these guys. And uh, and they've taken it to that next level, you know. So it's sometimes it's about going and 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 picking out that right channel. But getting started is usually the hard part because everyone comes to open mic night. I can't tell you how many times I've seen people come to open mic night to try comedy because they go, well, my friends think I'm hysterical or I'm funny at work. 
Then they come in there and they go, okay, fine. They go to open mic night and all the friends pile in from work. And then you go up there and you, you, you perform and do whatever it is you do. And then you get some laughs because everybody that works with you knows that funny thing you do around the water cooler every morning. Okay. Then you try to come back the next week because you think you're halfway decent at it, but none of your friends are coming to see you because they all saw you already. And now you're in front of a full audience that don't know you or how funny you are at the office. And then that's when reality sets in. So I didn't really know I was I knew I was good at it. And I could look back and listen to some of the things I did back when I was 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 green. I did a lot, a lot of, uh, you know, a little bit more race material. And uh, because that's what I, I could call from. But, you know, I didn't come from a, a rough neighborhood or anything like that. So uh, that changed because I remember before Jay Leno was Jay Leno. He was doing the comedy club circuit and I got to open for him one time and he actually pulled me aside and he said, he says, you know, you just just be funny, be funny, man. He said, don't worry about that. He goes, you can talk about about race and everything, but but, um, you, you know, it, let that part come natural. Let your natural experience from that happen. You know, um, you don't have to get out there and talk about stealing anything or whatever, anything or anything that's that's that that seems to be stereotypical. You know, he says, just talk about your experiences. And 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 then that part of it will flow. And so I was performing, performing a while, and then I just got to a point, and I remember just saying to God, I was like, listen, if you could just make it so I can make this much amount a week, uh, I'm going to go ahead and I, I'm going to try this, which is really weird because they always say you're not supposed to pray for anything. You're supposed to pray for guidance, but it's hard, you know, and I was young. So uh, it worked out that way. And then it's just, it's like anything else. It's like you with this podcast. You just didn't jump on there one day and go, hey, I'm going to do a podcast. And then six weeks later, you want to do, you say, oh, I'll do it again. It's a constant grind. It's a kick in the ass and you have to stay at it because no one cares if you quit. No one cares if you're successful. No one cares about anything. You have to be your own personal driving force behind any of this, you know, and that and, and that's basically what it, it ended up being for me. That's how I kind of got into it. And, um, you, you, you know, and like I said, it's like anything else. If you you perform three times a week, you'll be three times as good. You perform once a week, you'll be one time. Good. So it's all about putting in the, in the reps. Keep making plays, as Deion Sanders says. No matter what people are looking at you, with the night's not, lights not on you, just keep making plays, and hopefully somebody will see what you're doing at some point. Good deal. So you talked about Jay Leno. And, you know, when you when, when people look at your billboard advertisement for when you've got an upcoming show like you, you have like this persona about yourself, but you also have a really cool backdrop that you use on stage. So I think there's a story like behind that with Jay Leno and, you know, bringing the set in the whole nine yards. Could you share that story with us, please? Yeah, you know, it was years later uh, when I have this big stage set. I think you already seen it. You have a picture of it. It's a yeah, big stage yeah. set, and um, I, I think I, I I think I had seen him at a place called the Lures Performance Center, which is in Shippensburg, Pennsylvania. Well, at the time, the Lures was like, "Hey, Earl, we want you to come here, so we'll invite you to a show." So I said, "All right." So I go down there and I check out this show, and I'm getting to see the theater and stuff. And Jay, it happens to be the show that Jay Leno's on. They invited me to that. So um, he knew I was there and I was going to come see him back with afterwards. So I went backstage to see with him and he was there with his wife. We were going to try to catch uh, a dinner or something. But he had a he flew in to Hagerstown, Maryland, which was near Shippensburg and a private jet and was going to fly out and be back at his house by morning because he gets together on Sundays. And that's when he was doing all his writing with his writing friends for The Tonight Show. So I remember I saw him and I was like, yeah, you know, how you doing and everything? And he had seen a picture of my set and he's like, you know. He says, uh, you know, you, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to have all that stuff. You know, you, just, you get up there, you tell the jokes, you get paid, you go home. And I said, you know, that, that's great philosophy. And I said, yeah, I guess you'd be, you want to make it simplistic, but I'm not, I'm not you. See, you could have an empty whole stage up there and it don't matter what's on the stage. You could have anything on the stage. He actually had that night a choir open up for him, you know, which is really unusual for comedians. But, um, when I, when the stage opened up for him, you know, he's into cars. So they had this cool uh, antique car, this really fixed up car that I guess the local car club had let the theater user put on stage. Well, he didn't know that was going to be up there because his philosophy was is just go out there and you, you tell jokes. Everyone, you know, they say he likes to do cars and with cars. So they put it up there. But um, but when you go there and you see a show and you're waiting to see Jay Leno, you are waiting. That's that's the most the, the 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 
coolest part of the show of seeing someone famous is waiting for them to walk out. That is the cool thing. That's the biggest deal of everything. Everyone wait for you to walk out. Now they're waiting for you. They're there and that's you. So, I mean, it's just you. I, on the other hand, you know, I have to make myself look bigger than life. I have to look like I am, I am the, 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 uh, the, 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 I won't swear, but it's the stuff. I got to look like I'm that guy. I got to look like I believe in it. And so I want you to believe in it too, because if you don't go up there with the perception that you're good, why would it, why shouldn't anyone else believe it? If you're not good, people say, are you a good comedian? I go, yeah, I'm a great comedian. And, uh, and they go, well, what do you consider great? Well, I go out there and I do a really great job. You know, uh, a lot of times I get a standing ovation for the work that I do. And in show business, that tells you that you're doing really well. So I go by that, you know, um, and people are like, well, you know, you don't think it's kind of cocky to say that you're great. And I'm like, well, what kind of work do you do? Well, I'm a plumber. Now, are you a, are you a bad plumber or you're a good plumber? Does the side of your truck said uh, so-and-so's plumbing? Maybe. It doesn't say that. <laughs> it says so-and-so's plumbing. We do whatever, whatever, we do whatever. So it's the same thing, you know, it's just different when it's you, you want yourself to, you know, people always want to think that they're doing well and you're talking about yourself if you're talking about doing well. You know, you talked about standing ovations and I have seen uh, a couple of videos that, you know, you do get the standing ovations and I've seen the reviews. And if anybody that's gone to his show knows that he gets the standing uh, ovations at the end of the night. And for those that don't, you know, you need to go see his show, but and getting that standing ovation, uh, and you get it routinely, brother, because you are just really good at what you do. I have a question for you. And tell me about, like, the best night of your life in terms of comedy. Like, is there a night where you just said, you know what, <clears throat> this this stands out more so than, the, than most nights? Is there one in the back of your mind that you can kind of share with us? Oh, my goodness. I'll tell you what. I did... Um... Um, the, I did the uh, oh god I can't even remember I'm trying to pull them all up but I mean they're, they're, they're hap it happens so often it happens a lot <clears throat> and and uh, and they all seem to be really good I think for me it's like I, I have a good time at it I feel comfortable at it I think at the point now it's like where it's like okay well what time do I start and what time do you want me to stop I don't sit there and look at my watch and go okay I know I gotta do whatever whatever have me come off when you want me to, to come off. So, I mean, there's nothing better than like a theater, like the Whitaker Center and get a stand ovation at the Whitaker Center. And when I say standing ovation, I mean, and I mean, it sounds horrible and it sounds really kind of cocky as it does, but I, I, I think there's a lot that goes into that. But to answer your question, I think there, there's a lot of my shows that that I like the best. I think I like um, the Las Vegas, but I, I love, I just, I love them all because with that time that I'm on stage is my my uh, my my happiest time. When the show is over, I stay and I do a meet and greet with everybody. I don't have a special meet and greet fee where you do this. I'll meet anybody, anybody, whether you're sitting way up at the top or you're sitting there in front. I will meet everybody and and I will spend that whole time because I like that element of of of, of being there. And um, as far as performing and having the best uh, shows, they all seem to be pretty good. And I and I. And I'm, I'm, I'm drawing a blank because I know once we're done with this, one's going to come to mind. Well, but well, I'm let just me, sitting there. <laughs> well, let me ask you this. So have you ever been on stage and, uh, you know, just someone just from the balcony areas or whatever have just said, you know, hey, man, you know, we love what you do, bro. You know, or, or anything like yeah. that. Has that has there ever been a time like that where you're just doing your thing and in the middle of doing it, you just get love and that whole vibrational embracement of positive energy while you're doing it. I know you get it afterwards, right? Yeah. Ever been a time, yeah, it, man, where you just doing your thing and someone would just say, yo, man, love what you do, brother. Yeah, well, it's 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 funny you mentioned that because I, you know, now it's reminding me of a time I was performing. I can't remember what theater I was at, but I just go and I go. And and, and my my show, if you see my show, it'll take you through all kinds of stuff. We'll laugh. I'll seem like I'm, I'm being a little cruel at one point, but then I'll come back and I'll motivate you. The other night I was performing and uh, there was a kid in the audience. He was 18 years old. And I said, 18 years old, I go, what do you, and I was like, what are you doing here at 18 year old? Your parent, why do they bring you to a comedy show at 18 years old? I said, uh, 18, I said, where do you go to school? He says, yes, I just graduated. I was in uh, York, Pennsylvania. I just graduated from Central York, PA. I said, yeah, you're going to college. And I had kind of attitude on me because I have this whole thing that kids aren't learning. 
And he says to me, uh, yes, sir. I'm going to University of, Sa uh, University of California, San Diego, and I'm going to be a doctor. I'm studying medical. And, um, and then that just kind of hit me because I was sitting there and I thought to myself, wow, here's a kid, uh, you know, <laughs> a young kid, young Hispanic kid, by the way. So, you know, and I, not to get all, you know, cultural, my, minority wise, you, you know, you, you, it, it's a, it's a hard, it's a hard step. And I'm not saying anyone's keeping us down. I'm just saying it's a little bit more different, different only because of the environment that we may come from. Well, it turns out after I did further investigation on it, I found out that his, uh, his, his mother was homeless in New York City. Okay, moved here to to York, PA, moved to York, PA and was homeless there, turned it all the way around and ended up uh, the, the father was all over the place when doing it. She has a fiance now. And this son is like the 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 result of, of all of this. So that made me feel good. But if I'm on stage, sometimes I was performing the other night and it's so funny, like some women will go, hey, we love you. And I just go, OK, I bit, bit it off and I'm going. Yeah, you know, and I just got, you know, because it's what, but there's something about when a guy in the public yells out, we love you. There's just something about that because, you know, guys, we have this image of, of being tough, you know, and guys, they love, they love their favorite team. OK, they love their favorite TV show. They have a favorite car. They got a favorite beer. They got all this stuff, which is stuff that we. But when a man in public shows a love for another man, which we're supposed to do anyway, it just hits me because it takes a lot for that guy to come out of who he is supposed to be or what society believes he to be to, to express his love from from a guy that he basically knows that's just sitting there, maybe putting his smile on his face <clears> for like an hour. OK, we may not even have had any connection before that, you know, or he might have known me from the radio show that I used to do. And so that always breaks me up and that gets me to it. And, and when people do that to me and I'm on stage, it I almost have to stop because it just hits me and it makes me very emotional because um, I, I guess when you get older, I guess that's what happens to you, too. But, um, it, you know, everything has feeling to it now. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, that's the coolest thing. Everything's cool like that. Yeah. Everything is cool like that because that's the way we keep it in the sexy cool lounge. So absolutely, I want I want to ask you a question. So when you were growing up, or or, or maybe even now, like at the statue that you are, is, is there someone that you idolized in 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 comedy that you may have like uh, mirrored some of of your uh, stand up by, or you know how how is that for you? Like like you know some football players idolize. Some some people from previous generations. So as a comedian, was there somebody that that you were like, man, okay, yeah, I want to be like him, or I want to, or he inspires me to take my comedic art to the next level. Well, it's funny because, and, and you know, it's so funny how things change nowadays. Because this is probably not a popular thing to say now, but back when I was a young kid growing up, Bill Cosby was the influence. Because Bill Cosby was a, one of the few comedians that had albums that had records. It was like him. George Callen, kids, records are just that plays music, if you don't know. But we had one of those things up there, you know. And we had a, uh, remember old school, the big phonograph that had the TV in it, and you flip the hood up and then put the record on top, the TV was on the bottom. And Bill Cosby had an album called Right, where he does this bit about talking to, to God as Noah, which is brilliant, and all of this stuff. But I, I watch a lot of the old school stuff. And Don Rickles was probably like the one that... Um, that that I don't influence me most, but 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 I I really like the most, and I got to meet him, um, uh, in Las Vegas. Um, you perform in Vegas, and on Thursday, the Las Vegas um uh, Journal Review Review Journal, I can't remember which order goes in now, just like my name. Um, they come out and they they review shows, and if they like your show, they do the review on the show, and they say, hey, this is one of the shows you want to see this week if you're in Vegas. Because, you know, it's transient. Everyone comes to Vegas all the time. And uh, so someone came out and saw my show. And like, it's so the next Friday, I, uh, the Friday morning, I get up and I pick up this paper and they say, hey, here's some of the shows you you, you should see. Now, they had like the top 10, 15, uh, uh, 15 shows, we'll say, to see that weekend. You know, now I was at the bottom. I was like maybe 12, 13, 14, 15. But still, I mean, there's a lot going on in Vegas. 
you know, so to even make that list was pretty good. But they wrote in there, they go, oh, you need to see this guy. He's kind of like an urban style Don Rickles. And and um, and I was like, OK, well, that was funny. So um, and I was like, I don't is that is that a compliment? And the agent at my time was like, yeah, that's a really big compliment. So my last show was Saturday night. The guy comes up to me, the big Italian guy comes up to me and he runs a club and he says, uh, oh, listen, <clears throat> I want to see you at my office after the show. And it was so funny and it sounded like something out of a mob movie. And the irony of it was, this was the Riviera Hotel. And the guy that was running the Riviera Hotel at that time was a guy named uh, Steven Sharippa, who ended up playing um, uh, Bobby on, uh, um, on The Sopranos. So um, actually one of the nicest characters on The Sopranos, if you will. So I go back in the, after the show and I see his off. I walk in his office and sitting there in a chair is Don Rickles in the chair. And he's he has a paper up like he's reading the article about me. And he goes, and he goes, and he, he goes, he goes, oh, look at this. This guy's an urban style Don Rickles. And Mr. Rickles, this is Earl David Reed. He puts the paper down and he goes, how you doing? And he goes, oh, he's black, you know, the way Don Rickles does. So then he says, I'm just kidding. And then he goes up to give me a hug and I go to hug him. And after he, he, we break the hug, he's patting himself down to see what is what, if his wallet's still there. Now, there's nobody there. There's me, the manager, him. He doesn't have to do that, but that's just how he is. And that's how he was. So um, uh, I thought that was cool. I got to meet him. And, and years later, you start to get sad. You know, you know, when you follow your people that you like and you see them get old before your eyes. You know, Don Rickles, I saw him in Atlantic City. And then I saw him in uh, at the uh, the Sands Hotel in, where was that? Uh, in Pennsylvania. I think it's Allentown, Pennsylvania. Um, he uh, was sitting in a chair, but he had me come up and he talked to me on stage and stuff like that. And I thought that's cool. I actually got a picture of that. And somewhere there's a small uh, um, uh, video of that. And um, so, I mean, I, you know, I ran into a lot of people. Do I have the, the best, biggest career? Am I selling out an arena anytime soon? Probably not. But I mean, I do well. If you come see me, um, um, you will you'll be entertained. Um, I, uh, I I really enjoy the life. It's a blessing that I'm getting to do what I like to do because people within the sound of our voices probably are going, oh man, I can't stand my job if I have to go to that job. So if anything else, I'm getting to do what I like. I don't have to get my hands dirty, which which there's nothing wrong with that. I just know you don't want me building anything, and um, because I actually. My actually project I did this up uh, this spring, birdhouse. Somebody gave me a birdhouse. It sat on my counter for two years. <clears throat> Finally, go in the garage. I go, boy, there's a four by four piece of wood. So I made a post for it, and I put it in there, you know. And I put it up there, and, I, and I, I'm proud. Of, you know, it it looks like Section Eight, but it's still it's still some birds gotta live there. There's some broke ass <laughs> bird that'll live in it, and um, I. I so I mean I I'm I'm blessed to be able to do the skill that that I seem to be relatively good at. So, but I was going to ask you. Um, so what is what do you feel like is the best part of your job, right? Like if you had to like maybe narrow it down, like you, you do an hour hour and a half, you know, for anybody that comes to your show. But in the course of just the daily life, what 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 is the best thing that you really love about being a stand-up comedian? Well, you know, it, it's 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 a good and a bad thing. The hours. Like, if you make enough, if you make it, you can make a living <clears> at this <throat> doing this, okay? The goal is to make as much as you can a show where you don't have to work as much. So let's say you have a personal goal for yourself or like, you know, like you see guys like Seinfeld or even Jay Leno that night, he made, you know, a, a hundred grand that night. So you don't have to do stand-up all the time. But the problem is, is that free time between everything. And that's where you can either get into trouble or use it something to do creative. Like, like I use that time to reach out to people and other uh, venues that may not know me and try to get new venues and try to build that whole thing up. Because my goal for me is like, listen, I don't have to come to your venue twice a year. Most comedians are like, oh, I want to come every... No, I want to... I'm setting it up so I come there once a year and then that's it. I go through that whole schedule and then I'm done. And then I'll come and I'll see you there uh, next year. I don't have to play the same place uh, twice. The free time is good. 
Uh, if you need to get stuff done, if you need to work on it. And like I said, if it's, it's a business that you have to always be on top of it. So it gives you that time to, you know, to, to be on top of it. I see a bodybuilding trophy in the back. We have that. In common. <laughs> yeah, and we you do. Know, bro. You know, like, like that. When I, when I won Mr. PA, I'm telling you, it was work, 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 and, and just, and more work. And even when you put in all the work, like everything else in life, bodybuilding is a good lesson for life because you put in all the work and put on all the work and you do the best that you possibly can be. And that's all you have control over because you might show up at a show and there's a guy that looks maybe five times better than you and you've done everything that you possibly can do. And that's the thing that's a little dist distracting, but you don't feel bad knowing you did everything that you possibly can do, you know, um, and, and going into that, that show prepared. Talking about being prepared and, and the whole bodybuilding thing. So as a comedian, when, how do you work out new material and, and how do you know when you're ready to take that material and hit the stage with it? Is it just instinctive? And it's like, all right, I'm just going to go and I'm going to I'm going to run with this. Or do you kind of like marinate it up to the point to where it's ready to go live on stage? How, t talk to me a little bit about that that process. Process is hard. I would be the first one to tell you that when it comes to writing comedy and stuff, as as some of the stuff that I write is fine. I'm not the best comedic writer there is. I'm not. I'm a better performer. I'm better taking something and making it sound good. So when I have something that might be new, I might throw it out there and try it just when I, as soon as I think of it. And then the next time I perform again, I may throw it out a different way. It's so funny. My assistant sits in the in the in the back of the room. And uh, uh, sometimes I go, uh, we our relationship has changed because he's his job started out as him watching me to make sure nobody jumped on me at some point, which in this day and age actually became an actual job. Um, right. but I'm sitting who yeah, who, I mean, who would have you know, thought that yeah, you need exactly. to have somebody? Like, yeah, I was sitting there going, you know, hey, you know, hey, I'll come and I'll keep an eye, make sure nothing happens. Okay, we're fun, laughing and everything, you know. And then all eventually he's like, yes, I got to start working. So I said, well, listen. I'm going to put a uh, an Earl David Reed polo shirt on you, the staff shirt. So you, if you go up to people, they know you're with me. So you're not just some guy jumping up there. You have to establish it. But I throw everything out. And like, he'll sit in the back sometimes. I go, hey, that was good. Hey, Chris, write that down. I'm going to try that again later. I'll just tell him to write it down. And then maybe I'll try it a little bit later. And um, and I'm like, yeah, I'll be on some TV show. And they'll, they'll say, where'd you get that joke from? And I'll say, like, wherever I'm at, from here. You know, and uh, so it's it's for me, I don't have that kind of skill. I'm just more of, of a, a person that'll just piece it all together. You see some guys that are really good, like, you know, like Chris Rock is good. Like if I had to pick my top three now, it would be uh, Chris Rock, Dave Chappelle and probably a guy named Bill Burr out of Boston. Those guys, you sit there and you 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 watch them and not only are they good, they're not afraid to talk about anything. And even in the in the, in the landscape of the way things are nowadays, they still are like the front of the ship. They're going right, cutting right through the water and just saying, I'm going to do this because it's funny. It's not insulting because people get insulted about everything if they don't think it's fun. It's like, um, you know, so that's where I want to be. But I, I'm not, I'm not there. I sit to those guys and I, I admire those guys. And I don't watch too many other comedians either because I don't want to be influenced by something that they might be thinking of. Um, you know, so I, I'm uh, pretty much out there uh, myself. I take it around and I mess <clears> around <throat> with it, you know? Cool, do you? So I want to ask you real quick. So like when you're on stage and you're interacting with the audience and, and you have a really unique way of interacting with the audience. I mean, some comedians, they go up, they tell jokes, but you actually interact like with the audience, you know, whether it's, you know, up in the front or people in the balcony or whatever it may be. But I want to ask you, so when you're interacting with the audience, is do you just like feed off of the vibe that they're giving you? And then you can kind of you can kind of like mold some of that energy and interaction in with the, the storylines or maybe you even go on a different storyline because of what they're saying to you, even if it's just off the cuff. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then you're right. Because what happens a lot is, um, you know, I'll remember people. I have a thing that's called the Vegas closing, which I won't explain, but it's very ex exciting. That's usually what gets the people off the feet, their feet at the end. 
but it's like it's 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 not only interacting with people, but keeping them involved in that. Like I can go back to this person, whatever, and just move all over the place. It's called crowd work, is what they would call it in the business. Crowd work has a different, it has a has a um, a, 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 a two prong effect. Uh, crowd work. Some people think it's genius the way you can work off of that and think of something. And there's some maybe some straight up monologists that would think, well, crowd work is lazy because you're not coming out with anything. Um, uh, uh, you know, you're not something that you have prepared. I think it's more difficult to be to be funny uh, as the person than it is. That's my personal belief to be funny as the person uh, than to, to sit there and go, OK, because someone can write something for me. And if I can say it and it's funny, it's funny. But if I can be me and be personality, I think that's what makes a lot of people come out because my show's not exactly the same all the time. And, um, you know, it's not like going to see Errol Smith and, you know, because they'll, they don't care. They'll, the, the people will come out, they'll wait for you to sing Dream On. They don't care what it is. They'll sing along. Comedy's a little different. You always have to have a little bit of variety in it. And I'm just trying to make it so when people come see me, they'll want to see me again and not worry about having to sit through the same rhetoric. I would think that the uniqueness would be for people in the audience realizing that whatever is going on between you and a and, and someone else is like live. That's real time. That's like back and forth. And I would feel like, especially to continue to make whatever that ongoing interaction is funny, hilarious to the point to where the whole theater is laughing right. along with it in real time. I would think that that's more of the talent and the skill set and to just take something prepared and just be able to deliver it in the best punchline to get the laughter. Well, I, I, I you know, it, that's true. And I personally believe that both can work together. One's good. The other one's good. Yeah, they're both good. None is better than the other. You know, it, 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 it's about survival when you get up there and, and kind of getting a laugh. I had a woman that came up to me one time and she said, and, and uh, uh, came to me one time, she says, well, we, I had a good time, but my friend's not going to come back and see you again. So that always makes me curious because I'm going, I don't even see your friend. And then I do this Rolodex in my mind, what I might have said that might be offensive, which I, I don't care. I'm just trying to figure out. She says, well, she says, um, because she says she believes, my friend believes that you plan <clears throat> people in the audience. Okay. Because no one could do that well. And I thought to myself, that's either a compliment or or, or an insult, and uh, but can't can't do that well. And then I said to this woman, I said, "Well, you tell your friend how hard would it be for one guy to find I don't know twelve different people, and, uh, you know, and and, and 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 first of all to get them to show up, okay, and then have everyone know what they're supposed to do, and I'm supposed to know what everyone could do, because it's just easier if I go up and bomb." <laughs> you know, than to have all of that 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 stuff going on. So some people don't believe um, uh, 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 what they're watching, and um, you know, someone else wrote a nice article about me, and I was uh, and I and I just can't remember who it was, but it, not even an article, but a quote from me, and they said, um, um, he's not, you know, he uh, he's not juggling or eating fire, or he doesn't wear a costume, or doesn't eat fire, just a funny guy making you laugh your face off. And I like that quote because it's like, you know, you, you, you know, and there's an avenue for this. You'll get some people that, 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 um, um, you know, that, that do magic or something, or they juggle or something. And they put a couple of jokes around that. And then they get um, booked into a comedy club. A lot of comedians don't like that because, well, that's not comedy. And, you know, now you're a juggler and you're taking precious weekend stage time from a guy that actually tells jokes, you know, or ca characters, you know. Uh, you have a costume and you go up there in this character. And so people have a different outlook on it, but there seems to be a market um, um, for everything. I mean, you know, Larry the Cable guy is doing very well. He's got a huge mansion that he lives in. And of course, you know, you see like guys like uh, like Carrot Top that does very well, who has and, a Red and, Sea of and, Vegas who makes $10 million a year. So and speaking, you know. and speaking of Larry the Cable guy, you know, you have actually uh, performed with him, right? Or part of... Yeah. Of, of his show. Can you talk about just that experience for a quick minute? Yeah. Before I was at 105.7 X in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, I was at a radio station called Cat Country. I was doing mornings. People used to come up and they go, what? How does a black guy get on a country station? And I was like, you know what? The show is entertaining. It's all about entertainment. You know, entertainment doesn't have any color. I'm just sitting there to try to make you laugh. <laughs> is you that know? is that where we are now? It's like, we got to well, go what, there. <laughs> yeah. Like, well, you that's could just be a I person. would get that all the time. Or like, you don't sound black on the radio. You know, you, and, you, and like you, you couldn't just be a person at a radio station 
now. now. In, in, a, in a particular I, genre, it had to go there. Yeah, and it's funny too because like 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 my mother says, you know, <clears throat> and, you know, no one to be quiet. I told the whole thing about nobody. You know, the, okay, so I go up to somebody and 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 they don't look like what I think they're gonna look like on the radio. In this situation, I'm not black. Well, I probably would walk away after meeting them going, God, I thought that was a white guy, you know. Who says, God, you don't sound black on the radio? Who does that? I mean, it's like, I mean, we all walk away going, boy, I wish that guy was whatever. We never really say what we do. And then I, and then I have to uh, embarrass because I have to come up with some kind of uh, 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 dumb um, answer. And one, one guy said to me, he goes, yeah, you, boy, you don't sound black on the radio. And I was like, well, okay. I said, I said, well, what kind of radio do you have? And he sat there and he thought about it. And he's going, I don't know what brand it is. And he's thinking about it. And I was like, okay, well, I know where I'm dealing with this. You know, and some people don't know because they grew up in an environment where maybe they don't come across you and they don't know how to handle it. So a lot of them, I can't just take that as being malicious. You know, you got to pick your battles on something. You know, it's not like he, you know, came up to me and said, you didn't sound like an N-word on the radio, you know? Right. So, I mean, I, I you, you know, you can't you can't sit there and think everyone's trying to to to, to mess with you like that. But uh, yeah, I mean, even with that, with the cable guy, to get back with that, I did a show called Bill Engvall's All Stars of Country Comedy. There used to be a woman in the Harrisburg, Pennsylvania area named Dandelion. She was like, the, she called the trucker's friend. She did late night, overnight. Everybody knew Dandelion. She was, a, she was inducted into the Country Music Hall of Fame. And when she had her induction down in Nashville and we went there and broadcast, Everybody had like their 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 their, their kids induct them in and 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 and, and husbands induct them in. She had uh, Garth Brooks showed up and inducted her into this Hall of Fame, and that's the kind of person she was. We showed up one morning, my first time there, and earlier in my career there, and she's talking to Wayne Newton. Okay, I mean that he's there because he was playing a, a theater and somewhere on the other side of town, he was there. Um, another time we. Uh, <laughs> She says, where are you going for the weekend? And I go, I'm going to Las Vegas. She goes, I'm going to visit friends out from uh, uh, in California. So I go, she knew everybody. So I go, okay. So I went out in Vegas. I came back with my pictures from Vegas and my experience and all this stuff. She comes back with her pictures and the pictures and the people she went to see was the Jackson family. And she's got a picture with her and, and, and all of the Jacksons. Okay, Mike, all of them. So and I'm thinking to myself, OK, when can you get all of the Jacksons together for anything? And right. they all showed up for this picture with this woman. Of course, she beat me. But in any case, because of her, <clears throat> she mentioned to her friends in Nashville uh, about me doing stand up. And uh, and that's how I got to be on Bill Engvall's All Stars of Country Comedy. So it was me, Bill Engvall, uh, Larry the Cable Guy, another guy called uh, 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 Killer Bees, Foxworthy was there. Um, and, uh, and it was, and it was a great experience. I mean, you went down there, I was at the Ryman, uh, auditorium, which if you know anything about Nashville is the original Grand Ole Opry and, uh, and performed there. And so that's one of the best moments I was on that stage, you know, and that, so that was one of the best moments of, of, of my life, but <clears throat> it led into that sort of a thing. So comedy is universal. I think it's the one thing that in, in, in music, that's going to be pulling us all together. And I think that's what we have left. Comedy is universal. So speaking of comedy and your uh, performances, you mentioned a lot, especially in your promos about cake. So for those that have gone to your show, they know about the cake, okay? And we're not just talking about the birthday cake, okay? Cause uh, yeah, so for, for, for someone who hasn't been to your show, maybe is thinking about coming to the show and they see your promo and they hear you talk about the cake. Can you give us the backstory? Give us a little bit about what what is the cake about? Well, it was so funny because um, I was like, well, first of all, you know, as a bodybuilder, we seldom get to eat cake. Absolutely. And there's a, there's a friend of mine named Jessica. Jessica, I can't remember, Hutz, I think Hutzinger, or the, she just turned pro. OK, she just turned pro as a bodybuilder. And uh, and there's a picture of me with me stuffing all this. I'm not actually eating the cake. Actually, it was right during right before the Mr. Pennsylvania contest, because my birthday was in uh, March. So I had my hands in this cake and I had it all over me and everything. <clears throat> and, uh, and she sent me a message and she says, uh, you know, because uh, she's dedicated. She turned pro. She says, you know, what he says, you know, what that cake tastes like third place is what she said. And that would have stuck with me funny, but the whole cake thing started when I was like, 
uh, I think it was with the radio and I was like, listen, I always say, oh, we're going to do this. We're going to do this or we're going to appear here or whatever like that. And I always go, is there going to be cake? Because there's not a celebration without cake. You can't have a celebration without cake. So it got to a point now where I was doing the show and uh, and I was performing one time and I said, listen, uh, you know, I said, hey, listen, it, it, you know, if the show sells out. It'll be a celebration and we're going to have cake because it ain't a celebration without cake. And some guy um, uh, like two days before the show, and I'm glad he actually reached out to me and he reached out to me and he says, Earl, he goes, I bought a ticket. And, and the show had sold out like the week before. He said, I bought a ticket. Are we really going to get to have cake? Is what he said. And I was like, absolutely. So you I remember going it. over. and <laughs> I got, said it. Yeah, I said it. And I went out there and I got this big, big sheet cake and stuff to have cake. And it's like, it's so funny. You don't really understand what people latch on to. And I mean, he could have asked me anything. He couldn't have reached out for me at all. He could have just taken his chances and went to the show, which in any case, there wouldn't have been cake. But um, so that's what I do now. I go anytime it's a sellout, as the show sells out, there'll be cake, you know. And um, and that's why I try to sell them out early. I don't want to sell it out at the last night because I sell it on the last night. Then I got to scramble around and find the sheet cake, which are hard to get last minute. But I'll still get a better regular size one to piece them all together. So that's how the cake thing started. And um, uh, and, and matter of fact, after uh, any show that I do. That's the first thing that I eat. It, uh, like, you know, when you get, you know, you know, after you go, you go, okay, you're done with the show. You go out there and you maybe have a, a, a week. I only do maybe like a now because I'm older. I do like a day of being able to eat whatever I want and then going back to my strictness. Uh, but then it was always cake. Cake is always on the, the list there. So good deal. So, so for uh, Sexy Cool Lounge Nation, as you get ready to plan to come out to see him, understand that y'all need to sell this out so that y'all can have some cake and you got to sell right. it out on the front end because you can't have him going to try to get cake you know uh an hour before he's supposed to get up on stage and y'all like well they just sold out so hey let's go make sure that we sell out his shows so that y'all can get some of the cake all right yeah my assistant's the one that has to do last minute running by me it's uh <laughs> i think we're gonna start going it's not the cake that that, that becomes expensive it's the uh we're gonna have to go byof bring your own fork because those plastic forks and everything, that's what it adds up. Uh, but yeah, I, I, it's just fun. It's its kind of cute. You know, there's a comedian, uh, Burke Kershizer, he performed with no shirt on. And it was like, okay, that's that's fine. That's his thing. And this all of a sudden just kind of got into it and just started um, um, uh, being a... And the, and the cake goes, by the way. I don't go home with too much hey, leftover. Hey, hey, no, no cake is left over at the no, end of no the celebration, right? No way. All right? No cake is left... <laughs> Good deal. Hey, before we get up out of here real quick, um, on a, on a, on another note, like you are really uh, passionate about dogs. And if anybody goes to your Instagram, follows you on Facebook, and I suggest that everybody does, and we'll give them an opportunity to find out all that information. But you have a foundation and it's called Team Gabe Doggy Rehab Foundation, right? Yeah. And I'm a lover of dogs. Mm -hmm. And a lot of of the Sexy Cool Lounge Nation is a lover of dogs. So can you bring some awareness to us about the Team Gabe Doggy Rehab Foundation? And if anybody wants to be a part of that, like how do we get involved with that? How do we follow you with that? I know you just did something in your PA related to that. So can you just bring us into that realm of, of your life, please? Yeah, the uh, Team Gabe Doggy Rehab Foundation is a foundation developed to help rehab dogs uh, through aquatics and exercise. Uh, there's some times where people have an issue with their pet and they can't afford the, the, the full price of it and Team Gabe will step in and, and um, you know, try to accommodate them. Uh, if they need, uh, like we had a, a dog that was um, um, uh, going in and had a, a, a cancer and the operation was like $1,000. And so Team Gabe uh, jumped in there and, uh, and helped uh, pay for that. Because uh, if you know of anyone that has pets, they know. It's it's a it's, uh, it's expensive. No one ever wants to be in a position to go, boy, I really love my pet, but I was a little shy on some funds and I can't, I couldn't help the pet. No one ever wants to feel like that, you know? Um, so that's how that was developed. My dog's Gabe and Zadie. Gabe is a dock diving champ, which you probably see all this stuff on the wall over here is, is 
his awards and stuff. He took over my office. I don't even know where my stuff is. So, um, so for so for anybody listening to this, y'all y'all need to go on over to the YouTube channel when we get this uploaded and see all of these awards from yeah. his dogs yeah. that take up all of his walls. Yeah, my stuff moved all over the place. There's, 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 look, look, look. look. Uh, uh, hold on a second. I'll even show you. Look, look, <laughs> look at this. That's just part of it. That's just that's that's just part of everything that's going on. But there's uh ribbons up here on the wall. Look at this, all up on that wall over there. There's just all kinds of stuff. So he's uh he's a champ. He's retired. This was last year was his last year. And uh and Gabe, I have Gabe and Zadie. They were rescues. And I what I like about this whole thing is like it's almost like people. Like my dogs are rescues. They both came up on a truck from Alabama and um and it's like you, you don't you don't know about anything. It's like with people, you don't know what they are until you give them a chance to shine. And this dog, it was uh, ranked fourth in the world and just championship dog. So uh, he would win. When he wins, he gets money from when he wins. It's not it's not a ton of money. It's not like the you know Kentucky Derby or anything. But it was enough for me to go. Well, listen, I uh, you know I'm blessed. How can I give back? You know, and uh, so we started this foundation. If you follow me on Instagram and everything like that, we're trying to come up with a whole new site right now. Right now, um, what we're doing is uh, any show that you go to, we uh, usually have something at, at there where we take a collection from the from the show. Uh, I'm trying to set it up online to make it, um, uh, you, you know, where it's it's a it's a you know it's a it's a five hundred one. Uh, see, so I mean, I want to be able to set that up so people don't have any doubts of anything. Or, or what's going on. But we do uh, take, at this point, uh, people who have issues with dogs and stuff, and we, we vet the stories and everything and see if we can we can, uh, we can can help them out. Um, but yeah, it's about giving back. And I mean, I love, I, I love dogs. I mean, I love them and, uh, and, uh, and I always wanna be able to help other people. I also suggest that you, there's, um, you can get pet insurance. Uh, a lot of people don't know that, that you can do it. Uh, some of your actual insurance companies actually carry it now, but uh, there's another one that's called, uh, I'll look at it right now. It's called care credit care credit actually um, 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 is a card you can use for some medical things. But one of the things it covers is, um, is veterinary, veterinary bills and stuff like veterinarian bills and stuff. So um, yeah, but it's about helping and, 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 and giving back. The other show I did the other night was cover six K nine which is a, an, a, an organization that um, they train dogs to work with uh, veterans, retired police officers and firefighters that have some issues, you know, where they need this kind of uh, care and assistance. So they um, uh, work with that there too. So it's good. I, you'll catch me wearing a t-shirt once in a while. It's, 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 it's my t-shirts that on my merchandise. It says, uh, if you just reach out to me if you want one of them. It actually says, laugh hard, pet dogs, two ways to live your life, because there's two things you can do where you can't, where you won't be mad. You can't be mad when you're laughing and no one's ever been mad petting a dog. It doesn't happen. Laugh hard and pet dogs, y'all. I think that is the best way that we should probably uh, continue to live a portion of our life. Absolutely, brother. So thank you for sharing that with us. So before we get up out of here, tell everybody where we can find you on social media and give us a rundown again of the upcoming shows. If anybody wants to go and see you, give us an, a, a list of, of some of the places that you're going to be. But also, more importantly, where can we find you on social media and how do we stay connected with you moving forward, brother? OK, uh, if my show's coming up May 20th, the Appel Center, uh, the theater in, in York, Pennsylvania. Uh, that's going to be May 20th at the Pell Center.org to get tickets for that. Um, in Myrtle Beach, you can catch me at the uh, the, the Wonder Winds Theater. Uh, that's going to be on April, excuse me, August 21st. Uh, and actually in July, we'll go back to July, Bridgeport, Connecticut, the Bijou Theater. Um, uh, BijouTheater.net for that too. And uh, and uh, all over the place. Uh, Mickey's Black Box, the theater in, in Lidditz, PA. Uh, that's going to be December 1st. So I'm all over the place. Uh, dates get added. They they go back. I'm going back to Florida. Going back to Vegas. All over the place. The best thing you do is to follow me. Invite you do that at Earl David Reed on Twitter, at Earl David Reed on on uh, Facebook, and at Earl David Reed on Instagram. And the other thing too, I like to say too is like you know, uh, if you ever just need someone to talk to and you just want to reach out to somebody and chat back and forth, uh, I'm open to that too. And I, I I I say that, and some people are like, wow, you know. 
I mentioned I was performing before Christmas this past year. And I said, wow, because I was a guy in the audience. I said, what are you doing for Christmas? And he says, I'm going to be by myself Christmas. And I said, will you you uh, reach out to me and I'll and I'll I'll talk to you Christmas Day. And I always say that when I go to a show leading up to Christmas and on Christmas Day, I ended up with about 100 people that wanted to be able to, to chit chat and talk about something. So you're out there. I feel you. And that's why I'm going around and I'm telling these jokes, man, because I'm trying to bring a little bit of light in this everyday uh, world that uh, this big spinning blue rock that's uh, making us crazy sometimes. Absolutely, brother. So listen, so if you did not catch his uh, upcoming performances, again, he is going to be performing in York, PA, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, Bridgeport, Connecticut, and many, many other places. So if you need to find out where he is, the show notes will have his Twitter, we'll have his Instagram, we'll have his Facebook and everything else. I suggest that you get out to a show because it is so hilarious. Oh, and by the way, you're going to get cake if you sell it out. So stay and on top so, of that. Oh, by the way, it's, yeah. uh, Salisbury, Maryland. I mean, Salisbury, Maryland on September 9th with Comico Civic Center. I don't want to leave them out because they're great people. And they're and listen, they're consistent cake people. So if you're going to be there in Maryland, you better get your tickets early. <laughs> Try not to eat too much before you go, y'all, because y'all going to get no, eat cake, light. Right? Eat light, yeah. <laughs> Brother, it has been a pleasure. Last thing before you go, if there is one thing that you could tell the world about Earl David Reed and your mission, what would it be? Just be nice. That's it. Be nice. I mean, it sounds simple enough, but man, it goes a long way. You know, we out there and we're, we're, we're fighting against each other because everybody out there believes they don't belong in some capacity or other people believe that you don't belong and stuff. And they don't understand, man, that uh, this is this is this is all we're going to get. We're stuck with us. So just be nice. Just be nice to people. And that's what I got. All right, y'all. Y'all don't hurt him. Let's be nice. <clears throat> So what we're going to do on the end of this is, Earl David Reed, thank you so much for stopping in and giving us some of your laughter, giving us some of your positive energy into this world, man, and just keep doing what you're doing. I'm so proud of you. Can't wait to be at the show on uh, May 20th, your PA at the FL Center. I will be front and center and ready to laugh. Oh, and by the Bring way- Bring your own I, fork. Bring I, your I, fork, man. Bro, <laughs> I, have, I, I have a travel fork that I come with, bro. Okay. Got, got it on Amazon, bro. I, I'm coming. <laughs> No, I bring my napkin too, bro, because I'm because it's, it's gonna be sellout. So I'm ready for the cake. I'm ready for the there cake. You go. Okay. So, brother, it has been a pleasure having you in. Thank you so much for giving us some of your time, man. And everybody, again, if you get a chance to get out and see his performance, you need to. And if you've seen it, you need to see it again because it they're all one of a kind. All right. So let's make sure that we blow him up. Let's make sure that we follow him and show him some love because he has given us his time today and he has definitely shown us some laughter and love. All right. So family, as we get ready to get up out of here, always remember, and he said, just be kind. And what do we always do? We love each other. Love yourself enough to radiate your vibe. Love yourself enough to radiate your vibe. And let's make sure that we never forget family, that even though we do not have as much as others, we still have more than others. So let's continue to put good vibes into this universe so we can always get good vibes back. I'm Jimmy IV. I love you guys. And I will see you on the next episode.